Luke 19, 12, uh, let me see, 12 through, I'm not going to read all that. Uh, let's start in Luke 19, verse 12. I guess I am going to read all that. 12 through 26. He said, therefore, certain noblemen went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. And he called his ten servants and delivered to them ten pounds and said unto them, Occupy till I come. Which means invest this for me until I, um, while I'm gone. But his citizens hated him and sent a message after him saying, We will not have this man reign over us. It came to pass that when he was returned, having received the kingdom, then he commanded these servants to be called unto him to whom he had given the money. Everybody say, say the money that he might know how much every man had gained by trading. That's what it means to occupy, to trade, do business. Then came the first saying, Lord, your pound has gained 10 pounds. And he said to him, well, thou good and faithful servant, because thou hast been faithful in a little, have authority over 10 cities. The second came and saying, thy pound has gained five pounds. And he said likewise to him, be thou also over five cities. And another came saying, Lord, here is thy pound, which I have laid up in a napkin or what we would call a handkerchief. I feared, why did he do this? Because I feared thee because you are an austere man. You are a rough guy. Thou takest up that thou layest not down and reap where you didn't sow. And he said to him, out of your own mouth, I'm going to judge you, you wicked servant. You knew, based upon your words, that I'm an austere, hard man, taking up what I haven't laid down and reaping what I have not sown. Therefore, then you should have given, why did not you give my money into the bank, put it in the bank, that at my coming, I might have required mine own, I would have gotten it back with usury or interest. And he said unto him that stood by, take from him the pound, give it to him that have 10 pounds. And they said unto him, Lord, he hath 10 pounds. For I say unto you that every one which hath shall be given. To every one that hath is what I believe Matthew 25 says. To every one that hath, uh, every one which hath shall be given, given more. And from him that hath not, even that he hath shall be taken away. Now, Father, bless this word. Give us ears to hear, hearts to receive what the Spirit of the Lord would say to the church today. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, have your seats. And so I thought, uh, the, the, thank God for our media department, that, that was a little bit hype part of the message. <laughs> but the very practical things that I gave you from this theme that the Lord gave me for us for 2024, 20, occupy and maximize. That word occupy, it doesn't mean in the scripture the way we're thinking about it, in our colloquial language, occupy, we say, I'm occupying the seat. Somebody went to go sit on your seat. You say, excuse me, that's my seat. Or they, or they try to sit on your lap. You can't sit on my lap. I'm occupying the seat. But that's not what this is talk. Occupy in this context, it means do business. That's why the scripture says that he came back to see what they had gained by trading. To occupy means to do business. And I grew up uh, hearing in the church that Jesus is coming back for a church without spot or wrinkle. And in the meantime, we need to occupy till he comes. How many of us heard that? We got to occupy. Well, that occupy doesn't mean sitting, sitting again, as I said earlier, sitting by the dock of bay, wait, waiting for the clouds to roll away. It doesn't mean just waiting for the clouds to open up. It means being about our father's business, making the world better, maximizing your potential, utilizing every gift, every opportunity that God has given you to expand, to develop, to increase, to do better, and to do more for the kingdom of God. Watch this, so you can bring more in the kingdom of God. The Bible says that the kingdom of God suffered violence, violence taken by force. The kingdom of God is advancing, it's advancing. The question is, are you advancing in the kingdom? And are you advancing with the kingdom? Or are you just watching other people around you continue to excel, go to another level, and you just believe there's some special favor that's on them, but you just have not activated your favor? There's grace upon all of us, but Paul said, but I labored with the grace, okay? Um, you know, uh, sometimes there's a lot of people who often feel sorry for everybody in their family, okay, who doesn't do as well as them. The truth of the matter is most of us, most of us, now there's, there's a few exceptions, 
But most of us, many times when you come from the same family, you may have had the same opportunities. Okay? You just did something different. Now, maybe you, maybe you were, uh, I don't know, academically delayed or developmentally delayed or something. But for a lot of us in here, we just make, it's, life's about choices. Now, we don't like to acknowledge that. We, life is about choices. That, that's why I, you don't have to feel sorry for every, all your siblings who are not doing what you're doing. Okay? I don't feel sorry for every preacher who, who, or every minister who, who's not doing anything with ministry. No, I mean, you, you, gotta, you got some choices you got to make. Yes, there's a grace of God. There's a favor of God. But much of life, y'all, has to do with our choices. Amen. You can accept Jesus or you can reject Jesus. The, I, I accepted Jesus Christ at a young age. It made all the difference in my life. That's why I'm always crying out to you young people. And, and you know, at, at, there was a time I thought, man, um, you know, I didn't think I was missing out. I, I, my, I had enough experience in my own family to see all, all that they was doing, the partying, and drinking, and sleeping around, and getting high, and all. I saw, I saw real quick I wasn't missing out on nothing. Now, I, that I could clearly see. I could clearly see this ain't working out too good for them. Okay? I could clearly see being addicted is not the best. I could clearly see drama about whether that baby's yours ain't the best. Are y'all hearing me? Don't y'all get mad at me because I preach truth up in here. And so I never thought I was missing out, but I was sometimes jealous of people's testimonies. But you know, to have somebody's testimony, you got to go through the same stuff. And I couldn't get up and lie. Everybody was everybody talking about how they were delivered, they were delivered from drinking and smoking and, uh, you know, and they used to run around, and used to be addicted to drugs. I'm like, man, I, I got saved at 12. I don't have no sensational testimony. Until I was reading the scripture one day, Psalm 103, where it said that he redeemed thy life from destruction. And, 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 I, and I wrote a book based upon that scripture called Set for Life. And so the Lord showed me what he did. He set my life up early by me getting saved early. He redeemed my life from destruction. He'd have to, re watch it. He didn't have to redeem me out of destruction. He redeemed me from the destruction. Some of y'all stuff, some of y'all need to thank God that you were never in it. Come on now. Thank, thank God for being set free from addiction, but I believe it's better to never be addicted. Uh, thank God, okay? Th th thank God that you can take a drug and, uh, and the HIV not be activated or whatever. It's better to not have HIV. Y'all don't have to be, y'all, come on now. I'm, t I'm telling y'all the truth. And so, God, I realize God redeemed me from this. Life is about choices. And the best choice you can make, young or old, is to give your life to Jesus. That is the best choice that you can make. And so, in this scripture, we read about, he, he, about a man who goes away, at the parallel of Matthew 25. He goes away from Luke 19, uh, this king, and, and who, who, who's, who's, who's a king. He's a king. He got cities. He got countries. And based upon, he, he gave people different resources to do things with, and he came back expecting them to produce. One produced five, okay? One, one produced ten. And the other one took it, and he hid it. They were each given based, and Matthew 25, I like what Matthew 25 said about the talent. They were given based upon their several ability. And in other words, God's fair. God don't expect you to produce what, what you can't produce. Okay? God, God, don't, God don't expect... Now, now, you know, I, now I sing, and, and, and I've been singing for years. I, could, I used to sing better. Preaching messed up my voice. No, I'm serious. Uh, I used to be, you know, but when, when, when you're in the traditional Pentecostal, you got to do all the screaming all the time. Over time, that wears your, on, your, on your voice. So I, I, I used, I, and, but my singing, y'all, I've, I've never been able to do runs. You know, you know how you hear it? Yeah. Some people, I think, do runs because they can't hold notes. But anyway, <laughs> that's my personal, that's my person. So, there's some people, you never hear them hold a note. Jesus. That's holding a note. But Jesus. No, you can't hold a note. Okay. <laughs> But I've, I've never been able to do runs and riffs. And a friend of mine who was a singer who really did, he said, Herb, he said, he said, you don't have to do, 
He said, with your voice, you don't have to do runs and with the vibrato in my voice, whatever. Okay, and so for me to be jealous of somebody who does, who does runs and riffs, okay, that's not what God gave me. Everybody's not going to do the same thing. Don't mean you can't do your thing. Oh, come on now. You got, look at your name, say, do your thing, do your thing. Do, do, do your thing. You know, one of, the, one of the persons, I realized I was listening to somebody, somebody this morning, and <laughs> I was on the way, and I was listening to this person, and it's, she's probably the queen of, of riffs and runs, okay? And she's obnoxious. You know what I'm talking about. She's just an obnoxious person. Can sing, but she ob- says the most asinine things, says the rudest, meanest things, okay? So you can try to be like that person, or you can be you. Come on, look at look somebody, say, do you. So God gave them talent based upon their ability to do them, to, to be who they should be and maximize. And so when he came to the one who had won, he said, here it is. Here. He said, what? Yeah, I, I, just, I just wanted to keep it in a safe place, which means I don't know how long he was gone, but he did nothing with what God gave him. My question to you, what are you doing with what God gave you? What are you doing with what God gave you? And let me, let me get right to, right to what I want to talk about today to move further. He told them to invest this while I'm gone. He wanted to find out what their profits were, is what the New Living Translation said. But the one who had one said, I hid your money to keep it safe and we said in 2024, the Lord said, you can't play it safe. Stop trying to play it safe. You got to take inventory of what you have. Stop trying to play it safe. Use what you got to get more. So I dealt with Occupy on New Year's Eve. I want to deal a little more with Maximize today. To maximize, because our theme is Occupy, do business, and maximize. To maximize, it means to operate at your full potential. To operate at one's full capacity. To produce at your full potential. To make the best use of what you have. To make as large and great as possible. How many of y'all have a computer of some type, of some kind? Okay. You know, you can maximize the screen or you can minimize the screen, okay? Now, even on your phone, you can maximize or minimize. But if you maximize it on your phone, I'm just, uh, okay, I'm, I, I don't, this is what, I, iPhone 13, 14, okay? Uh, it's, it's at most five inches. Five inches by two, by two inches. Even maximization it's still only going to be five inches by two inches. If, I, if, I, if they maximize this on one of those big screens there, it's going to be several feet. You follow me? And so this cannot maximize as much as that can, but it can maximize. Whatever level you are, maximize at your level. Are you hearing me? It says, so to make large and great as possible. Uh, Paul tells Timothy something in 2 Timothy 4 and 5. He says, uh, watch in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist. And here's the part he says, make full proof of your ministry. Make full proof of your ministry. Work it to its capacity. Get out of you everything God's put in you. Do everything God's anointed you to do. Preach every message God wants you to preach. Go everywhere God wants you to go. Now, you can't go everywhere God wants, God wants everybody else to go. You can't do everything God wants everyone else to do. But he said, I want you to make full proof of thy, of your ministry. And all of us are not called to preaching, teaching, fivefold ministry, apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teaching. But all of us are called to life. And God did not put you in on earth just to be an astronaut. I said, what's an astronaut? Just taking up space. 
Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Everybody not supposed to be that's supposed to be asked, just taking them space. You used to be maximizing. I, I, I think I said this on New Year's Eve. What do you want to leave in the earth? Okay? And I'm not, and as, as much as children are, I mean, but, but y'all know there's people making children only want to have children. Who accidentally, they, they were just trying to have a good night. They were trying to have a fun night. And the child comes out of it. We got, now we got drama comes out of it. Now we got more poverty come out of it. Now we got paternity court comes out of it. Uh, now we got, now, now we got forced, forced child support payments come out of it. Now we got child going back this weekend to here and this weekend here. Now we got children don't even know their parents. And, uh, do do y'all see what this does to children? I'm not, okay. What, what it does to children? So, so you, you got to have a capacity and do something even beyond it. What are you leaving in the earth? That somebody says, man, I would, you were here. What are you setting up for, you, for the succeeding generation? And I'm not just talking about financially, because the Bible says that scripture that says a good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children, the amplifies that leaves an inheritance of moral stability. Are you even living in a moral way that your children would model, should model the way you live? Or do you do things in front of your children, operate in front of your children, that's too much to explain? You know, um, most of the stuff that we say wait till you're older to do, that you shouldn't do when you're younger, most of that you shouldn't be doing when you're older either. Just think about it. Well, you too young. You too young to be having sex out of marriage. Well, when you're old enough to have sex out of marriage. You too young to be getting high. Well, what age is appropriate to get high? Okay? I don't mean no harm, y'all, but I, uh, 80 year old pothead, weed head, just ain't, it just ain't right. Just, it just ain't right. Okay? And so, are you even leaving an inheritance of moral stability? Are you living the kind of life that, that your children, nieces, and nephews should follow after? What are you leaving in the earth? Make full proof of your ministry. So, to use what you have to produce, all you can produce means to ma is to maximize. God always starts us off with seed. He gives us something. He gives us something to make better, something to do something with. We, we saw in Genesis 1.11, uh, in Genesis 1.11, God said, let the earth bring forth grass, let it bring forth the herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree, the herb yielding seed after this kind, whose seed is where? In itself. God puts something in you that can produce. The seed is in itself upon the earth, and it was so. His seed is in itself. His seed is in itself. God put something in you, you got to get out of you. Oh, my God. Some of y'all know what I'm talking about. Some of you, you're not even really doing anything yet, but I, I, I've had people say, say stuff to me like this. I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing, but I know I'm supposed to be doing something great. I don't know where I'm supposed to be going, but, but, and, but, I, but I know I'm supposed to go to another level. And sometimes you've heard me say this, you may not know what it is, but you got to know what it ain't. If you don't know what it ain't, you'll settle for what you have. Come on now. You'll get, you'll, get, you, you'll get all intertwined and you'll get stuck with something. You know this wasn't it. You know this wasn't the kind of man you saw yourself marrying. You know this is not the kind of woman you saw yourself with. And okay, and I got to talk to y'all while I talk to you. I told you about the preacher who was, who, I told you about the preacher who was at the funeral and he started preaching against shacking, about preaching against drugs and alcohol. He started preaching about not tithing. All this is at the funeral. And then he stopped. I was right there. He said, some of y'all said, why are you preaching about all this now? He said, because I got to get you while I got you. <laughs> so some of y'all, I got I to gotta get you while, while I got you. You got to know what it ain't. So you don't get stuck in a situation. You're looking back 10, 20 years now and saying, what was I thinking? You weren't thinking. Let me explain this, y'all. When you are dating, and if you're looking to get married, you are interviewing. Who are you interviewing? You are interviewing a candidate, watch this, to be your children's father. You are interviewing a candidate to be your children's mother. Oh, let me go deeper. Let me go longer. 
You were interviewing a candidate to be your grandchildren's grandfather or grandmother. I'm going to take your thing. I realized something. I said this accidentally a couple weeks ago. I've always had the capacity, even when, from the time I was very young, to think long and wide. I've always, uh, God just graced me with that. The ability to think long and wide. Most people don't think long and wide. Most people think short and narrow. Short and narrow is when you make decisions just for today. When you think long and wide, you're like, this is good now, but I ain't going to look good 10 years from now. I know that tattoo look real good right now. Some of y'all just ain't thought long and wide. <laughs> it's cute, it's sexy now. But, and, and, and you walk around in the summer showing all your cleavage and breasts, there's a time you're going to want to cover that up. I said to my daughter Kendra, she was home, and y'all know I've talked about my daughter over the years. Ken, Ken, Kendra was home. I said, Kendra, I said, I'm surprised to see you with these, you know, baggy clothes and stuff on. I said, yeah, yeah you just show me. She said, yeah, she said, after I, got, after I had a baby and after I got pregnant, and, and, and she's even smaller now than she was before she got pregnant. You know, she's worked at it. And she said, after I prayed, she said, I, uh, I, I, I didn't, I, I realized certain things I was just wearing because I had the shape to wear. When I had the shape to wear it no more, I said, I ain't going to be wearing that. <laughs> you know what I told her? I said, Bishop Jakes told me. Because I once told Bishop Jakes one time, I said, Bishop, you got to help me with my daughter. I said, my daughter loves Jesus. She just don't love clothes. <laughs> and Bishop Jakes said, don't worry about it. Time and gravity will take care of that. I said, Bishop James told me. Time and gravity. Some of that stuff y'all doing right now, it ain't going to look good so good 10 years. You're going to be making different decisions. Now, 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 that, that's not as drastic with a tattoo as it is with a man or woman. That's not as drastic with a tattoo as it is moving someplace God didn't tell you to move to like I did in 1986 when we went to Maine and I went out. Now, now God reorchestrated my steps and redirected things. The GPS had to, had, to, had, had to figure out over the mountain and through the hills to get me where I'm supposed to be. But come on, it was a long journey that didn't have to be that long. Some of y'all taking a long way and God said, yeah, that's because you're doing it your way. Boy, I'm preaching up in this place this morning. I'm trying to help y'all to maximize your life. And so you got to think long and wide. In relationships, you got to think long and wide. In finances, you got to think long and wide. Okay, long and wide means how, uh, what's this going to look like 10 years, 20 years from now? Wide means who else is this going to affect? How, how is this going to affect others or other things in my life beyond where I am right now? You got to think long and wide. And the devil never wants you to think long and wide. The devil always wants you to think short and narrow. Adam and Eve were not thinking long and wide when they took the, the fruit of the tree. They were thinking short and natural and narrow. Has God said, oh, but right now, this is what it can do for you. And the devil always try to get you to think about right now rather than long and wide. So God wants to increase, in, uh, uh, increase your productivity, and he wants to produce through your hands. Now, watch this. The 5,000, we often preach about the 5,000. I preach about often. We got revelation from from John 6. And the 5,000 who were fed, filled with the five loaves of bread and two fish from the disciples, they were filled from the disciples' hands, not Jesus' hands. We always talk about Jesus performed the miracle of feeding the 5,000, but the 5,000 were fed through the 12 disciples. Jesus took the bread and the loaf, the five loaves and the two fish, and he blessed it. Then he put it in their hands. As they went to give it out, it kept increasing. But how, how many of y'all know it took faith to do that? Jesus, Jesus started taking this. I mean, I, I, mean, I, I can't do, do quick math like that, but, but you, take, you take five divided by 12. <laughs> okay. You take two and divide by 12. And he gives them each a piece and said, now go feed those 5,000. I would have been like, Jesus, you trying to get us killed? You see all these Negroes, I mean these people up here hungry, and you trying to tell me to go get them this little, you, you about to, 
they're going to they're gonna beat me. But as they obeyed him, as they gave it out, it increased. That's how God blesses you. You got to use what you have. Take what he's put in your hand and start giving it out. Start doing something with it and more comes and more comes and more comes and more comes and more comes. It does, the miracle doesn't happen in Jesus' hand. The miracle is going to happen in, through your hands. So what are some keys to, max, to, to maximization in 2024? And what's some keys to maximizing our opportunity? Number one, you're going to have to take inventory of what you have. You have to think a little more and search a little deeper. Think a little more and search a little deeper. What is it that you have that God will use? 2 Kings 4, 1 and 2, we read there about the woman who was of the wives of the sons of the prophet. And she said, my, your, uh, your servant, my husband, is dead. And you know that he feared God, but the credit is going to come. And in those days, if you couldn't pay your bills, they took your children. Some of us today would stop paying our bills. You couldn't pay your bills, they come and take your children, make your children slaves and, and work it off. So Elijah said to her, what, what should I do for you? He didn't even give her an opportunity to answer. He said, what should I do for you? And then he goes right to this question. Tell me, what do you have in your house? Whatever I'm going to do for you, you're going to start with something you have. You only catch that. What should I do for you? Tell me what you got in your house. Whatever... God's going to do for you, he said, it's going to start with something you have. What do you have in your house? And she said, your handmaid, had, watch this, she has nothing in the house but a jar of oil. Nothing but a jar of oil. And that is exactly what God used when she made it available. He prayed and the blessing came on it. And the oil continued and multiplied because she was willing to use it even though it looked crazy. She, I'm, I'm, I'm going to talk about this in a moment, but she despised what she had. A lot of times the reason why God can't do anything with what we have because we despise what we have. She says, I have nothing but. But means forget that I even have that. Okay? If somebody walk up to you and say, you know, Bishop Bailey, he's a really nice guy and everything, and he's got a nice shirt, but y'all know whatever come after that is getting ready to cancel the other part. She said, I have nothing but this oil. So she was despising it. And all of you, you cannot despise whatever gifting, whatever talent, whatever ability that God has given you at the level that you are. So you're going to have to ask God to help you see the opportunities that you have been presented with and what you have. Ecclesiastes 9, 10, 11 says this, whatsoever, whatever your hand finds to do, do it. Whatever your hands what? Find, that means I got to go looking for something. Whatever your hand finds to do. There's people even over the years who've gotten, because I, I use, I, it's an expression, I don't mean to offend anyone when I say it. Okay, some people think I'm being cavalier or being sarcastic when I'm saying it, and I'm not. People will say, well, 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 what can I do in the ministry? And I may respond by saying something like, get in where you fit in. Get in, you know what I'm saying? What talent do you have? What gifting do you have? Now, I came along at a church at, at a time, y'all, when at, you was either a preacher, you know, you, you, you was a preacher, you was a deacon, you was a, a, a minister, you were, which preacher? Uh, you were a usher, okay, or deacon. That was pretty much it. Can I tell you, every capacity, whatever you have, you can use it some kind of way for the kingdom. I text Dr. Wives, Dr. Stephanie Wives, I think on Friday, I said, listen, I said, can, can we do something to give our flu shot? She ain't in the choir. She ain't a deacon. She ain't an elder. She's a pharmacist. How can I use pharmacy to benefit the kingdom? Brother David back there, who does our 
ones are, are lighting and all this kind of stuff. I, 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 hadn't even, I hadn't hardly looked at that stuff. Then. You, I thought it was complicated. This, this stuff is like, the, is, is like the space shuttle on steroids. Okay? He's not an elder. He's not a deacon. He went to school for technical stuff. And it can benefit the kingdom. And so if you come out of a traditional kind of church where everybody got to preach, sing, or be a deacon, then you think, well, no, no, whatever capacity you have, that's why we have a medical ministry, that, that's why we have mental health ministry, whatever you are doing out there, you ask God, how can I use it for the kingdom? How can I use it in here? How can I use it to benefit other people's lives other than just lying in my pocket? Because when you benefit other people's lives, God will line your pocket. And some of you, you would be more prosperous even in your professions, if you looked at it as ministry. Ministry, I don't mean preaching, but a way to help people. So you have to ask God to help you see whatever opportunity you have. Whatever your hands find to do, do with your might. For there's no word or device or knowledge or wisdom in the grave where you are going. He said, find what you, what you can do here on earth and do it now before you die. He said, I return and so on to the, under the sun. Now look at verse 11, Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes 9 11. The race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, nor bread to the wise, nor riches to men of understanding, nor favor to men of skill, but time and chance happen to them all. Now let me read that from New Living Translation. It says this. Here's something I've, I've looked at. He said, the fastest runner doesn't always win the race. Y'all ever, ever see one of these races where someone is ahead? and they're really ahead, and then they trip and fall, and come in last, or way back, and they were supposed to win, <laughs> or they decide to smoke weed just before the race, or something like that. <laughs> then, you got to, then you just gotta wait till next time, okay? Even though, the, even though they, were, they thought they were gonna win. He said, the fastest runner doesn't always win the race, the strongest warrior doesn't always win the battle. The wise sometimes go hungry. You can be strong but not win the battle. You can be the fast one not win the race. You can be so smart, how can you have nothing to eat? And you're so skillful, but how can it not produce any income for you? Skillful, not necessarily wealthy. Those who are educated don't always lead successful lives. Oh my goodness. Y'all ever see people who got more degrees than a thermometer? and they're doing nothing with their life? I'm like, did you just go to school just to pay student loans? What are you doing with that? And th that's what the scripture is saying. He said, so even those educated don't always lead successful lives. Look at this. It's all decided by chance. Being in the right place at the right time. So this is saying that you need to understand when is your time to bust a move. You need, there are things that God, and don't be naive about this. Because when people are successful, a lot of things come together. A lot of time comes together. The Lord sent me here. Now, some of this I wouldn't even talk about early on because I didn't know what I didn't understand. And when I saw it happening, I said, okay, God, now I understand. When I came to this city in 1995 and the Lord told me to start a church here, first of all, I told the Lord he made a mistake. And last I knew, I'm supposed to be going back to New Jersey. Why in the world would I be coming here in South Carolina and staying here in South Carolina? And uh, I'm the, I really knew the Lord had spoken to me about New Jersey many years ago. And the Lord spoke. I said, Lord, now, did I miss you? He said, now watch this. He said, I had to change your assignment. He said, I had to change your assignment because of what men and women failed to do in this city. Now, that sounds very prideful. It sounds very braggadocious is a word. I went and looked it up. It's an actual word. Give yourselves a hand, South Carolina. I thought that was a South Carolina word. I went and looked it up. It's a word. Okay? I'm not, I'm not just being braggadocious but, uh, or prideful or arrogant. So the Lord told me to start this ministry. I'm like, God, I don't, don't want to be here. Another. Okay? When we started this church, three ministries, word churches in this city had major exodus. Some of y'all are here today who came from those churches. 
I didn't know those pastors. I didn't know their doctrine. I didn't know anything about them. All I know is the Lord told me to start this church, and one of the things he told me, I was sitting, I was sitting at a Zusa, Carlton Pearson Conference, that year. And give me come here, and the Lord said, go to South Carolina and bring it refreshing. I wouldn't tell people that for years. I got it written down in the Bible I had. It said, go to South Carolina and bring it refreshing. Now, you can't refresh what, have, what wasn't already fresh. So in the early days, I took a lot of persecution. Folks said, you got folks leaving these churches, going over there, leaving these churches, going over there, because they need to be refreshed. Now watch this. I didn't sleep with nobody. They did. Oh, Lord, I shouldn't have said that. Well, no, I slept with somebody. I slept with my wife. That's the point, okay? It was all kinds of crazy stuff going on. And so, now watch this. So this church in this grew with people like the Perrys who came here early on, who have been such foundation and part of the infrastructure of this church. And Lord, no, we need, I, I mean, Elder Perry felt, didn't you feel sorry for me when we started? I needed somebody to come here and feel sorry for me. Look at this man, working like a dog, doing all this stuff for him, all by himself. I got to help this man. I needed somebody like that. But if God didn't move them, okay, he wouldn't have been here. My point of this is that 1996 was my year to start Right Direction. No, 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 I need you to catch this. We may not be who we are, done what we've done if I started in 1980. Everything has a time. Everything has a time. Everything has a season. Y'all ever listen, and Sean, you know what I'm talking about. You listen to certain people who, who, who had hits, okay, and, they're, and, and, they're, and their music back in the day, they sold all these albums, and you listen to that, you say, like, that would never sell today. Nobody would ever buy that music today. They can't even sing. Y'all know what I'm talking about. But it was that time. At the time that they brought that music on, oh, it, it was fire. It was a lituation. I just learned that word. It was a lituation. Yeah, I mean, it was, but it was timing. And sometimes the success, and somebody needs to hear that the success that God wants you to have, it's in a certain time. My son Tyler, who, who's, who's our new city councilman at large for Columbia, come on, thank God for him. He had, last night we were at his uh, uh, um, celebration and recognition, but he also wanted to use it to recognize his partners at his new, uh, his new office uh, downtown. But he said something. He said, I won in 23. He said, but I, I have been running since 2021, and I look at all this as one continuous thing. He said, 21 set me up for 23. Come on now. He said, he said, he said it allowed me to see something, learn something, get my name out there. Uh, it, it, it put me in a position for 23, okay? So 21 was his time for foundation. 23 was his year for manifestation. Oh, come on now. Don't miss the time. And some of you, you're so busy looking for manifestation that you won't set the foundation of what God wants to manifest in your life. Everything has a time. Look at somebody say, don't, don't miss your time. Don't miss your time. He said, time and chance happen for everyone. And so sometimes we're sitting around, we're waiting. Well, I just don't know. I don't know. And you're missing your time. I don't mean it harm you, but, but I tell people this. And it's, it's even happened recently. People come and say, well, the Lord told me I'm supposed to be a such and such another church. The Lord told me that's my church. And, uh, I, but I want to serve here to the end of the month. I said, no, you need to go. You need to go. You, you, you missing, you're missing out. If the Lord told you you're supposed to be there, you need to go on. Don't miss your time. Y'all know I'm not addicted to people. I came here with nothing and nobody but my family. And y'all heard me preach it all, all the time. If you lose everything, you go back where you started. You started with God. If you started with God, everything you come... I, I don't get addicted to people. Really, me, 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 me and my wife, we, 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 we ain't, ain't planning on going nowhere. But, but she already said, she said, I know. She said, if, if I haven't left you, you'd be like, see ya. I said, no. I said, I will tell you, I don't want you to leave. I believe we're supposed to be together. 
but I ain't going to be on the phone. I ain't, ain't going to be growling and on, on the, falling out and snotting all over the ground. No. no. I heard Bishop Jake say something. He said, he said, if you can do without me, I have no choice but to get used to being without you. Some of y'all need to get a hold of that. If they could do without you, you have no choice but to get used to doing without them. And one scripture says this. He said, they, they left us be, that it might be shown they were not of us. If they had not been, if they had been of us, they no doubt would have continued with us. And some of y'all, oh, this is a word for somebody. Some of you, you can't move forward because you too, you too addicted to somebody in your past. Pastor Chandler preached about it when God told Samuel, fill your oil, fill, fill your home with oil and move on. Don't stay connected to your past when God's trying to give you a, gra a greater future. Who is that for? So you got to recognize I don't have time to be losing time. I don't, rather, I don't have time to be wasting time. Say that, say I don't have time to be wasting time. So your time is a non-reproducible commodity. You can get more money back, you can get another car, you can't get more time, you can't get that time back. Now God can add years, but you can't, you don't get that time back. I heard, heard somebody say one time, you know, I realized I wasn't the best father, I wasn't there for, for my kids and all that. Uh, uh, you know, the kid's grown now, he said, but, but the Lord told me he's going to give me that time back. I said, no, he ain't. Now, that, you can say that make you feel better, okay? You, you, you can't go back to that little league game when they 40. You can't go back to the, to, watch it, you can't go back to senior night. They have senior night one night. And my wife had to help me with those things. Because y'all, there was a time, I, I had to learn, I had to grow, I had to develop. And the more folks came and left, I, it, you made it real easy for me. Say, get yourself together. Because these folks, these folks were deuces. <laughs> and you didn't sacrifice this and sacrifice that and miss your family. And, blah. and so Pastor Marshall, she, she said, listen. She said, I gotta, we got to make certain decisions. She said, there's always going to be another one of those services. Not going to be another one of these opportunities for our children. And some of you, that's how you got to make those decisions. Is this going to repeat or is this a one and done thing that you're going to regret having missed? And because you don't have time to be wasting time. You have to make the best use of your time. Time is a non-reproducible commodity. John 9 and 4, Jesus, I got to work the works of him who sent me while this day. Why? Because night coming when no man can work. The New Living Translation of that verse said, we got to quickly carry out our task assigned by the one who sent us because the night's coming and no one can work. So watch this. I said this before. You can keep saying one day, or you can say, this is day one. Let me say that again. You can keep saying, one day, or you can say, this is day one. So the second thing, y'all, don't minimize what you have. The man took it and hit, well, it's only one. Uh, it's here in the napkin. He minimized the money, the pound that he had been given. God has given you something, put something in you that he has not put in anyone else. You got to know what's on you. You got to know what's in you. When Peter and John in Acts, the third chapter, they were going into the temple. And, that, and I, I, I did it, one of my face stretching exercises on that today, this week. In, uh, in Acts, third chapter, Peter and John were going to the temple, and the man was there begging. And Peter and John looked at the man, and he said, look on us. And the man looked up expecting to receive something. He said, look on us. And then he said this. He, he said, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, I give unto you. In the name of Jesus, take up your bed and walk. He said, I don't have money to give you, but I got some power to give you. I don't have money to give you, but I can pray for you. And when I pray for you, it's going to be better than money. And the anointing that was on Pete and John caused the man to never have to show up there and beg anymore. And so he said, look, you got to know what's on you. Somebody said, I got something on me. I got something in me that God didn't put in, in anyone else. Second Corinthians 4 and 7 said, we have this treasure. That means there's an anointing that we have. There's a gifting that we have. There's a talent. There's insight. There's strategy. 
Uh, there's no how that, that's in me that's not in everybody around me. 2 Corinthians 4 and 7, he said, we have this treasure in what? Earthen vessels. God has put a treasure in each of us that the exit of the power may be of God, not of us. So God's power is going to work through something in you. God's power is going to work through something on you. Glory to God. That verse from Amplified said, we have this precious treasure, the good news about salvation in unworthy earthen vessels so that the grandeur and surpassing greatness of the power will be shown to be from God, his sufficiency, not from us. So God has placed a treasure in each of us. Come on, say it and say, God, thank you for placing a treasure inside me. God's placed a treasure in you. God put something valuable in you. I don't care if you, if you come from the projects, you come from the jets, you come from, a, you come from a trailer park, you come from nothing, you don't know where you came from, you came from the biggest city, or you came from the smallest town, you came from the highest mountain, or you come from the lowest valley, you come from the ghetto or the contretto. That's just a country ghetto. God has put something in you. I made that word up, contretto. I didn't know there was such a thing until I started riding around, the, right, I, and I said, wow. I said, that looked just like, just like the hood. It just ain't as many of them. Contretto. And too many of us, we're minimizing versus maximizing our potential by overthinking. Look, look somebody say, don't overthink. The servant who was given the 10 pounds in the text, he didn't realize what he could have done with it. The servant given the one town in Matthew 25 didn't recognize his ability to produce at least one more. So when we look again about that feeding the 5,000 in John 6, he said one of his disciples, Jesus said, how, how are we going to feed all these folks? Oh, rather, yeah, where can we buy bread that these may eat? How, how can we take care of these people's physical need, food? John 6 and 8 says, Six and eight says, and one of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said, There's a boy here which has five barley loaves and two small fish. But he overthought it. He said, What? But, uh, uh, man, what about it? What is that among so many? So he had the God idea, but he minimized it. Y'all don't catch that. He had the God idea, but he minimized it. You've heard me preach this many times. I heard somebody preach this one time and say, Jesus took his idea and said, I can do something with that. No, 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 no. Jesus didn't tap into his idea. He tapped into God's idea. He tapped because the Bible says, before he even asked him a question, he already knew what he was going to do. He asked them, where are we going to buy food? He said he already knew what he was going to do. And, and, and can I tell you, God already knows how, he, how he's going to get you out of that situation. God already knows how your debt's going to be paid. God already knows how he's going to supply for your children to go to college. God already knows how you're going to buy that house despite the interest rates going up. God already knows where the down payment's coming from. God already knows how you're going to move and start that business. God already knows. God wants to know, will you stay in faith and get my mind? Will you allow me to give you the strategy? Because I already know. And God gave it to him. He said, there's a boy here with five loaves and two bread and two uh, five loaves and two fish, but he minimized it. He minimized it. He said, oh, surely God can't do anything with that. And so many times, God wants to use you, want to do, but you say, oh, man, God can't do nothing with me. Man, when I look at uh, uh, Minister Sean, I, I can't sing like that. When I look at, I, 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 I can't do that. Oh, when I look at, uh, I don't have it like that. Uh, and, and you look at other people, and I'm telling y'all, social media is messing y'all up. Some people get motivated, but a lot of y'all are getting are minimizing yourself because of social media. A lot of you are minimizing yourself because of social media. Everybody make yourself look great on social media. Or Pastor Dollar. <laughs> say one time, he said, I had to really learn to pray before I go to these churches they invite me to preach. He said, well, the first thing we do, we're going to look at their website. He said, I start realizing, man, you can make your church look like anything on the website. He said, I go pull up in there, and I said, now this ain't that. This must be their mission campus. 
folks, and, and there are professors who will show you how to blow yourself up. Okay? I'm telling you, y- y- y'all have seen them. Y'all, y- y'all, I don't mean not, y'all don't see no people who look like a, um, a rat's behind. And they put enough makeup on. And they look like Minnie Mouse. Now, don't y'all get mad because I tell y'all the truth. And you're like, oh, Jesus. That's, that's why the Bible said, be not deceived. God is not mocked. <laughs> Before you marry, brothers, listen, can we go on a date without the makeup? Can, can we go on a date without the eyelashes? I know that butt look good. (laughs) Is that yours or that a BBL? (laughs) Brazilian butt lift, because it won't be long, it's gonna be look like cottage cheese. You better ask somebody. You, need, you better be led by the spirit and not led by the butt. I'm preaching up in here. People are so superficial today. I'm really, really, and, and, and listen, I don't mean to harm ladies. Y'all can look as glamorous as you can look, and you look beautiful, but do you know how to talk to a man? You can look glamorous and beautiful. Nobody owe you a bag because you look glamorous and beautiful. No, no, nobody deserves to take you on no trip to the Bahamas. First of all, we say, we ain't going nowhere again. Now, tell me, say, now, I ain't that saved. I ain't. Now, what kind of save he talking about? And brothers, y'all falling for this stuff. Got the proof. I saw something, I think I sent it. I saw something on social media where um, a, 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 a young man, a young lady, and she happened to have a husband with them. They were doing something to celebrate another one of the girlfriend's birthday. He was the only man there. The meal came to $700, and they expected him to pay for everybody. He said, well, he the only man here. He said, I married her. And, and, and so, so they, they try to get her involved and say, well, what you got to say? She said, um, like he said, he married me. <laughs> some, some of y'all, some, some of you brothers, y'all fault, y'all letting these sisters trick you. Trick. You're letting that trick, trick. Yeah. <laughs> it must be the robe, y'all. I'm sorry. <laughs> I got a special anointing today. It must be the robe. It's the robe. I ain't going to wear this next Sunday, I promise. <laughs> I'm going to have to end this. But, but, but let me say, y'all, relationships, relationships, I don't know why, to maximize your potential, you got to maximize your potential. Relationships, there is an exchange. There is, there is an exchange, okay? Two are better than one. They have a great, a great reward for their labor for what they produce together. Every time you hear me say, I'm a millionaire, the truth of the matter, we're millionaires. Because when when we look at that net worth, we done calculated what she done put in there too. Uh, You you follow me? Two are better than one. And so relationships and marriage is about exchange. I know what you want to receive, but what are you prepared to give? What are you prepared? And and you you got to, usually you got to get the women to think about this more than the men. Because y'all got, y'all got these men jumping through these hoops. These young men today, really, Elder Perry, you, you can't even matter. I got to tell you about how it is today. It's totally different. Thank God for our models, okay? It, but but y'all, y'all got these folks, they, brother, I got to have this, I got to have that, I got to have, come with all this here, and you got to be making so many figures, and can't go to Cheesecake Factory. You better be glad you're going to, I could take you to McDonald's. Or send you to McDonald's. I mean, you ain't taking me to McDonald's because I probably wouldn't want to take it. Okay? But it's, it's an exchange. 
And so you say, wow, he got to make six figures. He got to have this. He got to be able to do this. He got to have a degree. He got to, okay, you want all this. What does that kind of man want you? Oh, y'all don't like me now. That man at that magnitude with all that going on that you want, do you deserve that kind of man? Can you contribute to the life of that kind of man? And sometimes, sometimes it's the other way around, but I'm, I'm trying to get your thinking right. Marriage is a means of exchange. Now, in, in a real old traditional marriage, it was that the man went out hunting and, and brought back some deer meat, okay, and a woman, and a woman uh, cooked the deer meat. Okay, man when I made the money and a woman and, and a woman then she, she, she took care of the kids. Most of our homes are not that traditional anymore. But there gotta be some, you can't just do nothing but look cute and have a Brazilian butt lift. What can you add? My son, my son keeps talking about his, con he, uh, uh, again, about him, about him, you know, w winning this, this election. And the first thing he says, he talks about his wife and how much he has helped him. Going back from law school when he cheated off her papers. <laughs> I remember when he first told me about her. He said, Dad, she's, she's a Christian and she helps me in law school. <laughs> Are you a helper? Y'all don't like me. Ladies, are you a helper? I know we, we, you know, I'm telling the men, I'm telling the men what they got to do. Are you prepared for that kind of man? The heart of her husband does safely trust in her. That he has no need of spoil. So we, this got to be an exchange. We both got to be getting something out of this. Okay? And sex is part of it. And the young you are is a big part of it. I got to remember it's a part of it this age of my <laughs> yeah, I, I, I've heard people, people get mad, talking, I ain't going to be doing that. You ain't going to be doing what? <laughs> Having sex? Oh, you, you just better go on with your single self somewhere. And ladies, it was a young man who told me he don't want none. Mm, you don't want none of him. I know you saved. I, 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 I know you, you want him to want some. Now you want him to be, some of y'all so uncomfortable. You want him to be willing to wait to get it, but you want him to want it. If he don't want it, It might be something else. <laughs> so, so if he say, I don't want nothing, you say, well, what do you want? The Bible says there are desires in this flesh. What does your flesh desire? And can I meet that need? Oh, Jesus, help me, Lord. It's the robe, it's the robe, it's the robe. I gotta end this. Don't despise what God's put in you. Y'all, Esau, Exodus 25, 30 through 34, Esau, this, he was hungry. And Jacob said, well, 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 give me your birthright. He said, you can have my birthright. He despised his birthright. Look at Genesis 25, 34. Jacob gave Esau bread and polish of lentils, and he did eat and drink and rose up and went away because he despised, please put that scripture up, Genesis 25 and 34, he despised his birthright. He despised it. That's what the King James said. He, did, he, he saw despised his birthright. He made little of what God had given him. He made little, and watch, he gave it up for something his flesh wanted. Lust of the eyes, lust of flesh, pride of life. A birthright was a special honor that was given to the firstborn. It included a double portion of family inheritance. The oldest son would sell his birthright or give it away if he chose, and by doing so, he would lose his, 
material goods, and the leadership position. He despised his birthright. And when you despise, you are thinking short and narrow rather than long and wide. Don't despise what you started with. Give me the scripture, I'm done. Zechariah 4, 8 through 10. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to Zerubbabel, saying, the hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house. Zerubbabel, he had started to build something, had started to build the temple, to rebuild the temple, and it looked like years had gone by and nothing was going to happen. What is it that you started last year that you've given up on? The year that we were supposed to finish. What is it that you started last decade that you gave up on? What is it that you started at some yesteryear in your life that you gave up on? And so the word came to Zerubbabel saying, your hands have laid this foundation and his hands shall finish it. Look at somebody say, I'm going to finish it. And when you finish it, you're going to know that the Lord of hosts has sent me for who has despised the day of small things. And they shall rejoice and see the plummet in the hand of Zerubbabel with the seven. They are the eyes of the Lord which run to and fro the whole earth. And so he said, he's, don't minimize what you have. I'll continue this next week. Don't minimize what you have. I started something, but what is this? It, it's, just, it's just five loaves and two fish. Give it to Jesus and he can blow on it. Give it to Jesus. He can increase it. Well, I started it. It doesn't look like it's, it's, anything's happening with it. Come on, go ahead and start it, and then start adding to it. And everything doesn't happen in a night. Pastor Chan, the priest this week, and Pastor Marshall talked about them coming to the promised land, and Joshua leading them as the general over this new generation, over, over, over these new breed of people who, were, who now, had, who used to be, children of slaves and now have to become have to become warriors and God said you I'm going to use you to drive all those nations out but then another scripture says but I'm not going to drive them all out in one night or one year he said but little by little little by little little by little I, I can't tell you there's several pastors because they, they, they've seen me do things and hear me talk and even see me in writing saying that this sanctuary is the manifestation over over 25 years of vision. And one pastor said, how do you hold on to a vision for 20 years? But a lot of people say, well, because I really, you know, I mean, left to me, I had thought we were going to do this. Some of y'all don't know. When we bought this land, my initial thought was we're going to build our first building right away. We were going so fast, I had to do something real quick. And then, then some of y'all were here back then. Then in, in, the, in the late 2000s, in late 2000s, I felt, okay, now we're ready to go to build now. And then a recession hit. When the recession hit and everything, everybody got scared, money dried up, credit dried up, all that. The Lord said to me, he said, don't stop, do what you can do. That's why we built the Family Life Center. Now, my initial plan was what you're seeing of Kidstown, what you're seeing at that Family Life Center, all that would have been in one big place, okay? But we had to keep moving. Sometimes things don't manifest the way you think it's supposed to manifest. You can't do what you want to do, do what you can do. I can't do that, but I can do this. Come on. I, I want that car. That, it's just in my time to get that car, so I'll get this car. I want that house. It's just not in my time to get that house. I'll get this house. I'll build up equity in this house, and then I'll move on to that next house and use the equity in this house to put me in a better position to get in that house. But whatever you do, look at somebody say, just keep moving. Keep moving. Keep moving. Progress is progress. Progress, um, and so my word to you today is keep on moving, Gloria. I don't care what it looks like. Keep, don't let the devil stop you. Don't let the devil stagnate you. If you're going to maximize, you got to keep moving. Well, I don't have everything I want to have, but use what you do have. Well, I can't go as far as I want to go. Go far as you can go, my God. Do you all realize that the Bible says when Abraham was in Canaan, God, God spoke to Abraham and said, go to Canaan. His father he was in Haran. God said, go to, go to Canaan. But when, if you read preceding that, his father, his father was on his way to Canaan. But he stopped in Haran. And now Abraham's assignment is to pick up where his father left off. 
Some of you, you have started at a level, but it's not at the level God wants your family to be. He's saying, I want you to pick up from here and keep it moving. Look, somebody say, keep it moving. I don't know what God has put on your mind. I don't know what regarding your family, regarding your finances, regarding your business, but my word to you is maximize, occupy, do business where you are and keep on moving. Well, well, well listen, we, we, we have somebody here today. Lindsay, where are you? Is she here? She just left. See that? That, that, that was the law saying she wasn't supposed to leave. Okay, but no, I, I think she's helping. But watch this. Young lady, Lindsay, she was working on her RN, and she ran into some issues getting the RN. She called me, talked to me, and I said, so they told her, just get out of the program. You're not going to be a nurse. And she was getting ready to get out the program. But when I talked to her, I said, well, do you have enough for LPN? I said, well, if you can't, be, if you, if you can't be, get, become an RN right now, do you have enough credits, enough courses for RPN, licensed practical nurse, before you are registered nurse? Okay? And she said, well, I don't know. I hadn't thought about that. I said, go and ask them. And then she said to me, she said, uh, uh, she said well, 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 they said, well, we've never done that before. That's not how this works. I said, well, we're going to believe God for favor. See, some of, you, some of you stop because they said. It ain't what they said. It's what God said about you and what you said about your God. Another time, she, was, when she, she, she had some challenges, and she called me up and we talked to her. I said, you're working for a doctor, Dr. Daniels. I said, have Dr. Daniels write you a letter of reference and recommendation, talking about what you're doing and why you're qualified to do this. She had him to do that, and then she was able to keep on going. And see, some of y'all, y'all, some of this is also about maximizing the relationships that's in your life. Some of y'all, you're just too independent, and you need a word from a man of God, from a woman of God, from a person of faith to tell you how to navigate through these obstacle waters. Because as long as you live, there's going to be obstacles. There's going to be stops. There's going to be bumps. But you're looking at a man, when you're looking at a woman, when, when you look at me and Pastor Marcia, and we talk about this all the time. We said, honey, she said, honey, everybody don't, hasn't been through what we went through. Everybody doesn't know how to navigate through these waters. And this is why people backslide when somebody died. When people backslide because they got a divorce. And people backslide because you had a miscarriage. I know nobody wants it. And people backslide because you had a, a foreclosure. And people backslide because you had your car repossessed. And I can't come to church anymore and get all depressed. Man, we have kept going through it all because we have a destination and I really do believe I don't just preach this I believe that if God be for me who can be against me I believe I got the advantage I believe greater is he that sent me than he that's in the world I know I keep talking I talk talking about, about my son Tyler but so many people and all the people who supported him at, 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 after he won in 2023 they said I'm so glad he didn't give up from 21 I'm so glad he didn't give up. There's somebody who said, I, I, I don't want you to give up. Come on. The Bible says we have a cloud of witnesses. But he said, lay aside every weight and the sin that does so easily beset you because you got a cloud of witnesses. Abraham is rooting for you. Moses is rooting for you. David is rooting for you. Solomon is rooting for you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hannah is rooting for you. Naomi and Ruth is rooting for you, saying we were at a place we could have given up, but we knew God has something more for us. Moses is rooting for you and saying, I thought my people were going to stay in Egypt, but God gave me a word. You've been going around this mountain long enough. It's time for you to move forward. It's time for you to maximize. It's time for you to stop making excuses. It's time for you to guess God to give you strategy, how to get over this obstacle, how to get around this hole. What the devil meant to stop you, don't have to stop you. God said, if you wait on the Lord, he'll renew your strength. You're about to mount up on wings as an eagle. You're gonna walk and not be weary. You're about to run 
and you're not gonna fake somebody say I'm about to maximize maximize me I'm gonna give it all I got maximize me I'm gonna blow it out the water maximize me I'm gonna get back in the fight maximize me I'm gonna show up again somebody's in here God said you got to show up just show up let them be shocked that you're there I thought they wasn't going to come back. I thought we made them drop out. Some of you, your victory is just to show up and say, I'm still here. I ain't going nowhere. I'm going to be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. I know my labor is not in vain. Somebody give God a shout. Shout! 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 How far to be with them? Don't you dare give up. I don't know where on your way to, but God said, don't you give up. Don't you cave in. Don't you quit. God got more for you. The devil is a liar. God didn't bring you this far to just bring you this far. There's more in you. There's more in you. There's more in you. There's more in you than what you see. So the end of Lindsay's story is now she's an LPN working for Prisma Health. And Reese just got a big ring. Maximize. Don't allow the devil to minimize your life. Don't allow your past to minimize your life. Don't let your mistakes minimize your life. There are some people who get more motivated by their failures and some people get buried by their failures. I want you to use every failure or a, looks like a failure. Not a failure, a setback. Come on, say this, say my setback is a setup for my comeback. Say it again, my setback is a setup for my comeback and 2024 is my year for my comeback. Hallelujah. Hallelujah! Glory to God. 